Good morning, everyone. Is everyone excited to be back for another day of NDC? Whoa. So to get the energy up, I, I like your enthusiasm. Let's give the, uh, the uh, conference a round of applause and some cheering to make ourselves heard in here, right? <laughs> Perfect. All right, so we're going to talk about C Sharp 8 and beyond. My name is Philip Eckberg, and I'll be taking you towards the light of F Sharp. So everything that we're going to learn in here today is going to make you all great F Sharp developers. Well, joking aside, C Sharp has over the years taken a lot of great language features from different types of paradigms and other programming languages. And we're going to explore some of the things that are being added in C Sharp 8 as well as what's coming in the next versions of C Sharp as well. It will be a big focus on the features added in the the current version of C Sharp, which is now C Sharp H, 8, which was recently released. And then, of course, we're going to discover some of the really amazing things that we might or might not get. Over the years, C Sharp has had a lot of interesting features added to the language. You know, when we got generics in C Sharp 2, that kind of changed the way that we build software. I came from a Java world where we didn't have generics, and we still don't. So we kind of miss out on those amazing features that make it easier for us to build more reliable applications. And then, you know, we got things like async and await in the language, which, which again changed the way that we build software. And even nowadays, we, we still learn a lot about asynchronous programming and the way that we can apply that in our applications. And all of these things change the way that we build our APIs, the way that we build the software, as well as how we build our packages that people might download from Egypt. So all of these amazing language features have been added to the language version prior to C Sharp 8. The, in C Sharp 7, we've got things like pattern matching, which will quickly take a look at for those of you that haven't seen that as well. And one of the really great things about C Sharp is now that it's open source. The compilers, you can go ahead and help out with introducing language features in the language if you so like to. So if there's something that you want to see in the language, you can always open an issue on GitHub and tell them that I want this feature added to the language, and you're going to have a long discussion about why that's not a good idea, and then eventually you'll give up. So this here lists a few of the features that are coming in C Sharp B next, and we're going to talk a little bit about those later on. If you have really good eyes, you can see that I have my little avatar up here, so I've actually contributed to the, the C Sharp compiler repository. I fixed a spelling mistake in this document. That's kind of the extent to my developer capabilities. All right, so we're going to go through a few of these cool features, but there's also this other repository on GitHub for the C Sharp language. So the C Sharp language has its own repository. The compilers, which is what used to be called Roslyn, it's now the .NET compiler platform. It's all written in C Sharp, and this language repository lists the potential features they want to add to the language, right? So it's a totally confusing why this is separate. Someone probably thought it was a good idea, and the interesting thing here is that this is the milestone for C Sharp 8. C Sharp 8 is going to be released somewhere around 2080 based on the cadence of the developer features they're adding here, right? Although C Sharp 8 was released with .NET Core 3.0, which was supposed to be a part of Visual Studio 2019. Although when Visual Studio 2019 came out, .NET Core wasn't really there, and the features for C Sharp 8 require you to be running .NET Core 3.0, right? Everyone doesn't know that, but if you're on full framework, you can't really use the C Sharp 8 features. So that's a little sad, but everyone should jump on the next version of .NET because that's the best thing, right? So let's go through a few of the C Sharp 8 features. Enough PowerPoint for a while. We're going to go through some of these really cool features that are coming in C Sharp 8. But before we do that, I want go to go through two of the major features in C Sharp 7. In case you haven't seen those, it's going to be very confusing when we start talking about C Sharp 8. One of the things they added was an improvement to how we work with tuples or tuples or whatever you want to call them. So these, this thing here, which I'm going to call tuple, totally wrong, we have this multiple values returned out of this method here. So I'm constructing this container of two fields, which is going to have a named integer of x and a named integer of y, and this constructs this type. It's not anonymous, because what I can do now is that I can go ahead and call this method, and this will now allow me to call p.x and p.y. Let's zoom in here. So that's useful. And what we also can do is that this isn't limited to two values. We can, of course, add even more things in here. So you're probably asking yourself, why do we do this? Because it's going to help us when we introduce pattern matching. And we'll get into those features in C Sharp 8. Now, you can see here that we're getting some squigglies here telling us that there's now a problem here. This won't compile because we now 
aren't returning the same kind of container values that we are returning out of, that we were expecting up here. So I'm gonna undo this here, otherwise everything else is gonna fail. And now what's happening here is that 100 is now mapped into my field X and 200 is mapped into Y. Now I can call this as I showed you just a moment ago that you can call this method by just simply calling get point and this will map the tuple into this local variable and you get two fields X and Y. Kind of makes sense. But then we can also deconstruct this, which means that we can take the tuple and deconstruct that into something else. So I can say that I want this, this tuple deconstructed into two new local fields. This here is also using the tuple syntax, but now in this local, local context here, I can now use X1 and Y1 instead, right? But it's all about saving characters. Over the years, the c -sharp language design team have focused a lot of efforts into making it easier for us to write less code. So we can improve this a little bit by saying that instead of having to specify integers twice, you'll just infer that. So we can say that I have two local variables. They're de a deconstructed tuple. It'll map X into X2 and Y into Y2. Now what happens if I do this? How many of you think that X is going to be mapped into X2? Leading question, it's not. We now have a bug in the application. Because now what I'm doing here is that I'm getting the X and mapping that into the first parameter here. So it's doing positional matching, right? So it's taking the first value and putting that into the first thing that it's deconstructing. So this is helpful for some of us, but it will be more helpful in C Sharp 8. Now, next up, they added something in C Sharp 7 called pattern matching. If you've ever experienced other programming languages like Swift or Kotlin or Haskell or F Sharp, you've probably seen pattern matching and how powerful that is to leverage in our applications. So the idea here is that I have a, a thing and I wanna match based on the, the trace of that object. It could be looking at the particular type, it could be looking at particular properties and values, but in C Sharp 7, we kind of got a, a small version of pattern matching, like the first version that's it's useful, but it's not as good as it could be. So we're using the switch syntax. So I'm saying here, based on my shape that I have in my application, this here could be deriving from the same base type, or this could be an object, it could be whatever, it doesn't have to share the same, same base class, basically. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, well, in the case of the shape being a triangle, what I'm going to do here is I'm gonna cast this object to a local variable of t, which is only available in this particular context of that uh, case block. So then I can use this, this filter here, which we've seen with exception filters, to say when the, the triangles side A and B are not equal, we're gonna match on this case here and run this block. Then for other, all other triangles that don't match that particular criteria, we're gonna match on the second one here, and if it's a rectangle, we're gonna match on this one here. So that's kind of powerful, but it's pretty much like the, the old way that we built software, right? So how do we improve this and make it better for, for everyone? Well, let's jump over to C Sharp 8 and talk a little bit about the recursive patterns, which has been introduced with the new version. I believe that some of the C Sharp 8 features, you can still enable them if you are running on full framework, but that's unsupported. You can set the language version to C Sharp 8 and it will do its best to compile that and work with full framework. But when you use things like asynchronous streams, which we're gonna look at later, that, that probably won't work because the classes aren't available in .NET full framework. So now I have this application here. I've translated it, the same switch statement that I had into something called a switch expression. So we have this new thing here that looks really nice, looks more like it's coming from a functional programming language. So now I can say here, based on my shape here, I want to run this switch block, which is now not introducing the case and break and all of that. We're now leveraging the expressions instead. So in case of it being a triangle, again, I'm gonna capture that as this local variable of T, and inside my, my expression here, I can leverage that particular local variable. So I can do t.a here, and I can get all the other ones, and I get IntelliSense. We all know now that this is a triangle. You can zoom in here, that's really nice. And I can't use that outside of, of that block, right? So I couldn't use it in the, in, the next, in the next place. It wouldn't know that this exists. Makes sense, right? So in the case of it being a, a rectangle, we're gonna catch, or we're gonna match this block here. And then we have this, this discard mutation here, which is for all other cases, we're gonna match on this particular block down here. Now remember I said earlier that this doesn't have to be inheriting the same base class. So if we look at the triangle, 
I could inherit from shape, and that would probably be a good pattern in my application. But in this case here, we have a triangle that doesn't inherit, inherit from anything. We have a rectangle that doesn't inherit from anything. But I can still use this switch expression to say, based on that thing, we can still match on that. So it's pretty much like the old, if it's you know get type and it's equal to type of whatever type you have, but this is a nicer syntax. Now the difference with this discard or this default statement here is that if we compare this to the default keyword in the switch block, this here will in fact match on nulls as well, which I don't believe it will with, with the switch. All right, so now let's look at another example, a little bit more added to this switch expression. So that kind of just looked like a translation of what we had in, in C-sharp 7, but with a little bit of a nicer syntax. So in order for us to leverage the existence of tuples in the language, we can now introduce more patterns. And of course, as you see here, we have the triangle, we are matching that on capturing the local variable. We can still apply the same type of filter which we did with the, like we do with exception filters, and we could do that in C-sharp 7 as well. But now, with the new patterns, we have a few different things. We have a tuple pattern, a positional pattern, and a property pattern. So the tuple pattern will allow us to say, if this is a triangle, and then it's going to recursively break this down and say, if I can deconstruct the tuple into something that looks like this here, we're gonna match on this, this particular block here. So this means that on our class triangle, we now have a method called deconstruct. This will deconstruct this particular object into to something looking like this here. And I can deconstruct it out to a tuple, and I can use that in my pattern to match on this particular thing. So what that, what, what that really means is that I can say, for instance, for this reference type here at the end, which is my point for where the triangle is posi positioned on my screen here, I can say, when I have a, a point or when I don't have a point, I really don't care. So we have this discard notion here as well. So I can say, I'm gonna capture whatever's deconstructed for the first parameter, the second and the third one, and I don't care if you have the fourth or not. We could say that I require this, this thing to match on the particular tuple where the last one is null, right? But in this case, I don't care. So that's pretty cool. So we can deconstruct the triangle and match on that. So this will use a recursive pattern to first check it, the type of the triangle and then match on the particular thing that it's deconstructing to. Next up, we have something called a positional pattern, which will also leverage the deconstruct. So the same thing with our, tri with our rectangle, we're deconstructing the width of the rectangle, the height, and as well as the point. And in this case here, what I can say is that if the width and the height are both zero, and I don't really care if you're trying to position this anywhere on my, my screen here, because it, it's not really a valid rectangle, I'm gonna capture that for this block here, and this is going to return this, this string here, of course. Right? So as you see here as well, this method returns a string, and, and this switch expression thing here, all of the expressions are just simply returning strings. So this here, of course, uses this position based on how it's deconstructing the object. So we could be saying that for all the rectangles that have the width and height of 100, we're gonna match on this particular block here. If you want to say that the rectangle needs to have a width larger than 100, you would have to go up here and use this, this when expression. Right? Then we have something called the property pattern, which allows us to do pretty much the same thing, because you're probably wondering, well, in this case here of the deconstructor, or a deconstruct, I'm not gonna be able to add that to all the things that I'm not in charge of. If I'm using libraries from NuGet or whatever, it might be impossible for me to add the deconstruct and you know, developers in the open source community might not be focusing on that right now. So what you can do instead is that you can say, well, based on the, this being a rectangle, which will be the first thing that it's matching on, then it's going to say, if it has a property called width here and the value is 100, it's gonna match on this particular pattern, right? Then of course we can match on any rectangle and we have this default pattern as, as well, which uses this discard notion. So that's pretty powerful. So of course we can abuse this, which we pretty much can with any language feature. So in some situations you might be expecting a Boolean here, for instance, I want you to, based on the Boolean being true or false or null, I want to do different things. So if the Boolean is true, we're gonna have this item visible. If it's false, it's gonna be hidden. If it's, it's something else, it's gonna be blinking on my, my screen here. But what's interesting, of course, is that it could change this to object and it will still match on that thing. So this here will make sure that it's in fact a Boolean and then that the value is evaluating to true. All right, so that's pretty powerful as well. 
Another example of, of using the tuples is in this case here, I'm getting an HTTP response message. And based on two of the different properties on my HTTP response message, we have these two properties, the status code and the is, is successful status code. I'm constructing this tuple here. And based on the values inside this tuple, I'm running this switch expression. So I can say here that if the first value in our new tuple is not modified, as well as a fruit that the successful status code is true, we're gonna run this thing here. We're gonna load everything from the cache. And then if it's 200 okay, and I don't really care if the successful status code is set to, do, to true or false, which is, it's always gonna be true, right? But it's gonna extract the shape out of the message. And then for all other status codes where it's a successful status code, everything from you know, 201 and, and upwards, it's gonna extract that from, from the shape. But if it's a request timeout, and I don't care if the framework or whatever it's going to tell me that it's not a successful status code, it's going to recursively run this method. In the real world, we would probably implement some backing off from the API and so forth and, and build this differently. But it kind of illustrates how we can now leverage a tuple and construct a tuple like we do here, and then write some really nice switch expression here for matching on that particular trade off that, that object. And then, of course, we have this, this final one, which is saying for all of the other status codes, we're going to say that this is a network error. And then, of course, we could introduce the, the default or the discard one as well, which will throw another exception. Right? Good. So that's pretty nice. And of course, this, this, you call this the same way as you would call any other method as well in your application. So that's the, uh, the switch expressions and the, the recursive patterns that were introduced in C-sharp 8. Now let's have a look at another interesting feature which was added recently, and that's ranges. So how many of you have seen this span of T here? So about half of you have seen this thing. This span of T is a way for us to represent a collection of data without having to copy the array over or copy the list over whenever we do try to get portions of that data. When we do manipulations on the collection of data itself, we don't have to get the memory overhead of copying it over or, uh, or such, right? So if I want to grab 4Q7 here, for instance, I can do that in memory and just point to that particular set of data, and it's super memory efficient. So the way that we do that is now by, we can slice this up to say, I want to grab the fifth element to one from the last. This here is now introducing this new range syntax, which you can apply on all your different, your, your indexes, right? Index, yeah. So now we can say here, I want to go one from the end. So the hat syntax is telling us start off the end and then go one back. So we're gonna get eight here, hopefully. And then it's going to give us the, the fifth index. So that will be five through eight, I believe. So now if we run this here, it should say five, six, seven, and eight. For some reason, when I, I did this demo, um, when I built the demo, I started off writing one here, but I got totally confused by myself because array starts at zero. So I always say the wrong number here, but now it works, right? So we get the, the, the five, six, seven, and eight. So this here allows us to slice up the array and get a new array out of that. And we can run the for each loop, of course, on that particular slice. And this here didn't introduce a new array in memory. It's simply pointing to those particular elements. And of course, we don't have to initialize a new local variable. We can do that in line in our for each loop as well. So we can say, give us the element from index one through to the index number four. But what's interesting is that this here introduces something called an index. This here is, um, we can write this as a, what we call an index now, which looks like this. So we have our index, and we can say, I want you to start from the, the fifth element of the end, and I want you to point to that particular thing. So that would be which number? That would be number five. That kind of makes sense, right? So how do we get the, the last element? Well, as you see in my comments here, we can say, give me zero elements off the end. That would make sense, right? If you run this, it's gonna tell us that we're indexed out of bounds for some reason. If we say I want the, the first index off the end, it's gonna give us the nine. Totally confusing, right? So we have that number nine here. I'm printing out the third thing here. But if we go back to, to this range syntax here, what happens if I say, give me everything until the end? How many of you believe this is gonna work? 
and no one. It worked. So that'll actually give us the, all the numbers from one to nine. Makes sense, right? Nope. There's probably some comment somewhere in one of these language design meetings where they talk about this and someone much smarter than me decided that this is a really great thing to do. All right, so this here is now pointing to one off the end, which is the last element, so it's not really pointing to one off the, off the end. And we can do the same thing. We can create two of these indices, this line here, and this is gonna, then we can pass these along in here. What's interesting is if we change this one here to zero, let's see if that works. That works. So it's totally different, I guess, if we do one here, that'll give us six through eight. But if we do this, does that give us the same thing? So that will give us the correct thing. So whenever we are using the collection with these indices, right? So when it, we're now saying we're creating an index that's going to point to one off the end. But if we're trying to use this on the array like this here, we would get a different element than when we use this range syntax. It's pretty, right? <laughs> Is it? Right, yeah, so, so you're saying that you're, it's correct because you're saying that you start off the end and you want to list all the elements until that. Yeah. Uh, all right, so even though it's correct, I still think it's, it's kind of confusing. <laughs> all right, so let's talk about something more that's confusing. Let's talk about nullable reference types. So, you know, over the years, one of the most you know, common problems with in building software is the null reference exceptions. And I believe someone once calculated on how much money has it cost the world to have nulls in the language. It's a lot of money, right? So now they finally decided that, well, it was probably a mistake adding nulls in the language. We shouldn't have nullable types. So now we can opt in to say that I want everything in my solution or in my method or in my class to be appeared as it's not a nullable which means that we have to explicitly say that I want to opt in to have nulls in my language. That's pretty cool, right? So how does that work? Well, we have this very nice new project structure, and we can now say that I want nullable enabled, which means that I can now introduce this nullable types in my programming language. And this is also very confusing, but this is telling us that it's not, it's, it's telling us that we are now going to interpret the nullable types, not like we did before, but we're going to allow us to say that use this new nullable reference type syntax. Let me show you what that means. So on my person here now, I've enabled this new nullable reference type feature, and I now have a nullable string here. So normally what you do is that you have your string name here, and we, we know that this is a reference type, so it's nullable, right? It makes sense. But now that I've enabled this feature, I have to opt in to say that this here is now nullable. It still compiles, but it's going to give me some warnings. You see that there's these green squigglies everywhere because this is now telling me that you have potential null reference exceptions. You should probably go ahead and fix all of these. In some cases, the compiler is correct, but you know, most of us know better than the compiler, right? So if I remove this and say that, well, string, my string name here is now not nullable, which means that you have to initialize this. The constructor here is now going to tell us that, well, you should probably initialize that. But what happens now is that if we just apply this in our project, or if, especially if you're working with open source and we have NuGet packages that people download, if we start just changing the behavior of our applications and you know, adding more parameters to the constructors just to make this work, now of course, my person here is now going to be ensuring us that name will never be null. Unless, of course, you explicitly add null to, to the constructor. But then you'll get a warning somewhere else. So this here now changes the contract of the application, and that's not really what you want. So the first thing that you'll probably do, let's undo this here. To get rid of that warning inside this class, you will probably say that, well, I, I'll have this as a nullable, and I'll see wherever else in my application this might be a problem. So we can immediately see here that in this method called insert or update, we are now getting a squiggle here telling us that, well, 
you, you have a prob problem here and this could potentially be referencing a null, null name, right? So we're trying to get the, the length out of our name here and that's going to be null. So I can say, well, don't get the length if it's null then. So we can use the same thing that we did earlier, right? But now we're gonna start off having question marks everywhere in the code and that's, you know, we're making up for the characters that we saved. We can also do another thing. We can promise the compiler that name in fact here isn't null. So they, unofficially this is called a damage operator. I think that's a great name. I don't know what the, the that's an unofficial name, so I don't know what the official name is. So now we are, we, let's fix this by saying question mark here to say that if this is, if this is null, don't go ahead and get the length. And of course, person here is a reference type and this here, is, since I've enabled a nullable reference type, this is now a non-nullable person or we're trying to promise that this is never gonna be null. But I can say that, well, I want this to be able to be null and now we're gonna get another squiggly down here telling us that person here is potentially null, so let's not get the name and then let's not get the length if, if any of those are null. Starts to get pretty nasty. Let's undo that. But you know, what happens if we now try to, to call this insert or update method and, and adding null here? Now it's probably gonna tell us that, well, you have the same problem that we had earlier. You, you can't really send null in here because this here expects a non-nullable type. But you know, I know better than the compiler, so this is not gonna be a null object. So the warning goes away. This kind of illustrates one of the interesting problems with this. Now, of course this is very powerful, especially if you turn on warnings as errors, you're gonna blow up in your, when you compile this. So one of the things that you can do is you can say, well, for this particular case here, let's get rid of that. So we get the warning. I can say that I want nullables disabled. And for everything you know, in that particular context or this, in this case inside the method, it's gonna disable that check for the nullable reference type. But we can also do this on the method level, right? We can do it on the class itself. Or we can move this to the namespace or outside that, which will do it for this entire file. So we don't have to go into our project file and enable this for everywhere. We can simply go ahead and disable it for the project and then go ahead and enab enable this wherever we want to start refactoring code and make it a little bit better. I think this is a really great addition to the language, especially having done a lot of Kotlin recently, for, recently where everything is non-nullable by default. You have to opt into things being null and the compiler is gonna slap you really hard on your fingers if you try to force it to do something that it, you're, you're not supposed to. So this is a great addition. What they have also added now is this null co coalescing assignment, which will allow us to say, if the person is null, I want you to do this thing here. So instead of ha us having to write person is equal to person, person, right? That's going to be a fuel character flex. And you know, with the, I'll show you a feature that's coming in the future, which won't compile. You know, I didn't have time to implement all the features myself, and we have to document. You can be able to do this. That would be nasty, but that requires a runtime change as well, and they haven't done any runtime changes for a very long time. Most of the things that we see are compiler magic, but since they're doing runtime changes, they can add more and more interesting features to the language. So that's null real reference type. That's a kind of cool addition to the language question. So your question is, how do we handle, if we're using third party libraries, and that this can use kind of a, a false sense of security because it could tell you that you don't have a problem when you might have a problem? Well, it's not gonna be foolproof. It's not gonna look through how everything works inside those libraries. You have to trust the library author to do this properly on their end. But you know, you can still, as I showed you, like even if you have a null object, you can, you can force this to, to be null, right? So if we say, person here is gonna be equal to null, even though we, we might not be allowed to do that, it's gonna give us a warning, but you know, I can promise that this is not gonna be null, and we'll still have a, actually I can promise it down here. And we can promise that this is not gonna be null afterwards, right? So, there we go, sorry. So, 
even though that the compiler is trying to give us a little bit of help, of course, it's not gonna find all the, the cases and we still have to write our tests, test our code, and we're still gonna end up having problems. But it's kind of a first guard for finding the null reference exceptions. So you're right, it, it can be a false sense of security, but it's, it's still better than we, what we had earlier, <laughs> at least I reckon. All right, so that's the renewable reference types. Now let's talk about using declarations. And I actually added a demo in here from, so, that I saw on Twitter yesterday, uh, which is really interesting, but we'll get to that after this first one. So now, with using declarations or enhanced usings, one of the things that we can do is that we can say, I want to introduce a using block that's disposed whenever the method now ends, right? Whenever this method is completed, it's gonna call disposed on whatever we use using var on. So I don't have to wrap this entire thing in a block looking like this here, because if we, are, if we have multiple usings inside the, the method, it's gonna end up being nasty and not looking that very nice. So now we can say using var up here at the top, and this is now going to make sure that we dispose this HTTP client whenever the method is completed. So how do we abuse this? Other programming languages, like Go for instance, has an interesting notion of def the defer keyword, which means that we can now defer execution of something until the method ends. So in this method here, I'm simply saying, well, I want to create a new thing here, which I'm going to defer to execute whenever the method ends. And this comes from, from this guy here, Ruben, he works for Microsoft, totally smart guy, and you know, it's, 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 this is interesting. So what we're doing here is that we are simply, we have a struct here that's implementing idisposable, which means that when this method here disposes, it's gonna invoke the action that I pass to the constructor, which means that this code here is going to be executed when this method is done. Make sense? So if I run this here, it's gonna say, hello NBC, and then from Philip. All right, so we now deferred that execution to the end of the method. Some other programming languages like Go has this default in the language. And this is an interesting thing. So that's the, the using declarations. Small additions like that are very welcome in the language. All right, so another interesting thing is, has ever, anyone here used local functions? Yeah, a few of you, oh, a lot of you. So you know, uh, if you're using local functions, one of the drawbacks is that if you accidentally use a local variable in your class or in, in the context or a property in your class, it's gonna capture that entire context as a reference to that object. You can change things and you know, it, it becomes kind of nasty. So I have this over-engineered method here inside my compute method, which is now accessing my, my name property inside the class, and that's not very nice, right? Because now it has to capture that into this thing here and the generator code for this gets uh, rather ugly. So what they've introduced is a way for us to have a static local function. Now what that means is that I can no longer access things inside the class or inside this method itself. Which means that I promise that the over-engineered method in this case is not going to have any implications whenever I call it. So you'll have to trust whatever you pass into it and what it's returning. And that's a nice addition, especially if you use local functions quite a bit. All right. One of my favorite features added to C Sharp 8 is going to be something called asynchronous streams, which means that we can now work with streams of data in an asynchronous manner, which has been, you've been able to do this before, but now this syntax allows us to much more easily work with these streams of data. So imagine in this case here, I call this method, which is going to return me a collection of data, but each element is going to be coming to me asynchronously. So I'll be able to handle each element as they arrive. Right? It could be reading lines from the disk, it could be fetching things from the web and you know, reading chunks of bytes, by, uh, byte by byte, right? So the way that we do this is by applying the await keyword inside of our for each loop to say that this here is going to asynchronously loop over some data that we get. So if we check this implementation, what we have here is we now have a way for us to say for each element from zero to 10, you know, we're gonna go ahead and fetch some data, we're gonna load something from disk, we're gonna process some data. And the key thing here is that we're using yield return together with the I asynchronous, I async enumerable. This is going to do all the magic for us, it's going to set up this state machines and all of that, all of those interesting things, right? 
So the yield return here will make sure that it notifies whoever is calling this method asynchronously that you can now process this particular element. So if we run this application, it'll stream out the numbers to the console here. It's not blocking, you know, it's, it's just processing this as it goes on. A little bit of a more real world scenario is if we use the file system to load some data and then we might process that. Now to make it easier, I've just added some some delay to make sure that you know it works. So we have this method called get lyrics. It's going to use the new using declarations as well to open a stream to a file on my disk. It'll dispose of that whenever this method is done, right? Even though we are asynchronously returning elements as we go on, it'll make sure that it disposes that properly at the end of the method. And then we say that we want to read each line asynchronously as long as that, that doesn't return any nulls. And then we want to do some processing on that data, maybe chunk it up, maybe it's a large set of customer data or whatever, you know. And then we want to return that line back to the caller. Before I run this, there's gonna be another change in C Sharp 9 probably, where you can do this in line as well, so you wouldn't have that, that line uh, variable outside of that scope as well. But that's coming later on. All right, so now if we run this, it should asynchronously retrieve or return the data to our console, right? Let's see if you all know the song. All right, so you were just Rickrolled by the console app. So that's pretty cool. So this here is now leveraging this new asynchronous streams with the async and await keywords. So even though that the async and await and all the asynchronous principles have been around for a long time, they're still adding improvements to those language features and the way that we, we integrate with APIs and so forth. It's interesting because even before they released this feature, I tried to do something similar like this. I tried to use the yield return in an asynchronous context that I wanted to, to use that in a for each loop and, and so forth, but it just didn't work. So this was a really nice addition. All right, so the, the final one that I really don't want to show you because it's really nasty, it's default interface methods. I'm not really particularly fond of being able to introduce methods on my interfaces, but let's go through the problem they're trying to solve. So we have this interface here called iCache. I have my memory cache or in-memory cache that implements this particular interface. It allows me to, in this case here, just sets up a dictionary, allows me to add and, and get and retrieve a, an element based on a particular key. Super simple, it's just a over-engineered solution for a dictionary, right? Which I'm using anyways. But I could be implementing this for a re Redis cache and whatnot. Now, of course, I can use this in my application in a rather simple manner, I can say, well, how about just add two elements? I don't care about the particular types of those, those things. But now I'm the library author of this interface and some default implementations, and I want to improve this interface. I want to add generics, right? But if I were to simply, I, I don't wanna add a generic interface, which I, I could do this, but I don't wanna do that. Instead, I wanna introduce, I want to introduce two new methods that allows us to leverage the get and add methods in a um, generic manner, right? Super simple, I'm simply saying here, this is going to be a generic method. It takes the, the, the generic parameter here as the key and that'll return, return a value. Pretty simple. Although the problem now is that I have to implement this if I bring down this NuGet package, all of the people that used my package will now have to implement my new methods. And we might not want to do that because for library authors and open source community workers, you know, they, they get a lot of hate for you know, updating their interfaces and, and so forth. People get about upset about the most funny things. So what I can do now is that I can say, well, I want to provide a default implementation for this. So I can use the, the expression body member to do that, or I can use a normal, normal method body for this as well. So now all of a sudden the, the warning goes away on my class here, so I have no idea that I updated this package and I have no clue that I need to update this, this particular class because we were providing these default implementations, right? It's an interesting addition to the language and you know, if, if you look at this, it kind of introduces multiple inheritance as well because I can implement multiple interfaces. If I have multiple interfaces that implement their own methods, things are going to break and blow up. 
So how do we use these different methods now? Well, I've implemented that, my in-memory cache implements the interface that has these default implementations. But what's interesting here is that if we look at the methods available on my in-memory cache, I don't have a generic version of add. So that's at least pretty good. So how do we leverage these things here? I reckon that no one's gonna run into the scenario where you're not gonna be able to see this because everyone's injecting their interfaces, right? So if we force this to be an iCache, and now we check which methods we have available here, we now have the generic versions. So as long as I'm telling this here that I have the interface, it's going to allow us to use the generic versions, and it's just gonna work. And of course, if I do this, it's gonna blow up. Because my, whoops, because it's going to try and get hello world, and it's gonna get a Stack Overflow for some reason. Great. Or it tells me to go read Stack Overflow, I don't know. All right. So that's, I think it's an interesting addition to the language, but uh, I see the problems with introducing this as well, because it now allows us to, for instance, do the multiple inheritance thing. But the, the good thing is that you don't have access to the particular instance of the object. So you know, one of the problems if you're doing C++, there's many problems with that, but if you do C++ and you do multiple inheritance, you know, you have access to the instance of the object. But you don't have that here. You can't magically access this here, so this will not be available. Hopefully not. Right? Well, you would be able to access the, the static things or the things on the interface, but you wouldn't be actual, actually able to access the, the instance itself. Right? So that's all of the interesting features that I'm gonna show you in C-sharp 8. Let's now talk a little bit about the things I didn't show you in C-sharp 8. So we went through a whole lot of interesting features. Everything from you know, default interface methods to nullable reference types, the recursive pattern, async screens, enhanced usings and ranges and null coalescing assignments and static local functions. So what I think is interesting is that they have the capability of adding all of these amazing language features still after after so many years of this language being on, on the planet, right? They still find a way to improve it because you know, building software in, in 2019 or 2020 is not the same as building software 20 years ago. So the language needs to evolve with the community and with the people that use the language for the particular types of applications that we're building. The features that I didn't show you is read-only members, but that's only for structs, so most of us probably don't use structs on a daily basis. But you can ensure that a member in your struct is read-only, which means that it doesn't have any implications when you call it or when you use it on any of the other things on your particular struct. We can have alternative interpolated verbatim strings and stack alloc in nested context, as well as unmanaged generic hooks, right? Now, what's coming after C Sharp 8? I'm not sure what the version number is gonna be. Microsoft tends to to skip a few numbers, especially when it comes to nine, so we'll see if the next version is gonna be X or 10, or whatever you wanna call it. One of the things I like to, to say is that you saw the, the milestone for C Sharp 8 had a lot of features, right? 89% of the features they added in the milestone didn't get into the language, which means that we shouldn't be sad if they cut the features. So whatever I show you here, some of the features have been on their to-do list since C Sharp 6, and I bet that a lot of these language features that they've recently added have been on their to-do list even long before that. You know, the reason for them rewriting the compilers is because it's really hard to add things to a very old code base. We all know that just throwing code out and rewriting it is the best approach. So one thing that I showed you earlier is this target type new expression. So instead of us having to specify the thing we're creating, we're now moving the, the thing that we're creating over to this side. We're not really saving a lot of characters, maybe three or four if you use a var keyword. But where it becomes interesting is that, in this case here, I'm creating this dictionary of string and list integers. And I can simply say, give me a new instance of this, and in my collection initializer, I can say, give me a new instance of, you know, whatever that thing is. And it'll just figure that out. And this here requires a runtime change, so we're probably gonna wait until, I don't know, .NET 5, which is gonna be the, the next version of .NET, where they're moving everyone over to core. Okay, so one more thing they wanna do is allow us to, again, write less characters. So instead of having to be very explicit about, in this case here, I'm creating this, this tuple here with two default values, 
this is going to give us a default of integer and default of string. Why not just allow us to say, give me the default of this tuple and it just figures that out. Simple compiler magic. Not really a major feature to Azure Language. So one of the things I really enjoy, and I hope this is gonna get here soon, because what's interesting as well with the way they work with the compiler is that you know, C Sharp 8 was released together with .NET Core 3.0, which was released, what, six months after Visual Studio 2019. So if you update Visual Studio today, you will get the latest version of the language and .NET Core, right? And the same thing goes for, for new features like this here, the generic attributes. If they just add that to the compiler, they could ship that with the next version of Visual Studio. This means that it can become very confusing if you work in large organizations where people tend to have different versions of Visual Studio. So how many of you have wanted to do generic attributes? You've done filters in ASP.NET, and you know, it's kind of a few of you have wanted to do that. So now they're introducing the, the way for us to do that. Previously, you had to inject you know, the type in your constructor, and you know, that became a little bit ugly, but no longer have to do that. We can now simply say we have this generic attribute. Don't know why it's taken them so long, but apparently there's maybe some, some some hard things to solve when it comes to the attributes. Another nice addition to the language is the color expression attributes, which is a way for us to apply an attribute on one of these parameters to our method to say, well, I want you to take the, the argument or the, the expression that was passed in the condition here and inject that automatically as a string here. So all that's doing is allowing us to skip writing the message ourselves for debug.assert here and the compiler will generate this code for us. So if we have a, you know, a logger or we have a test, we can now get a little bit more better information out of this here. So library authors will be able to, to leverage this and, and make it a little bit easier. Okay, so we also want ways for us to check if types are equal to, to null or they're not null or, or if they are a particular thing. So of course, I wanna say for all, I could use pattern matching to solve the same thing, but why not allow us to introduce something called negative condition if statements? So we can translate this thing here into maybe shape is not a triangle, or if, if not shape is a triangle, or unless shape is a triangle. I don't think they've really decided on which way to go here. I'm not fond of adding new, new keywords for a thing like this here, all right? But, you know, maybe it's not, it's a, it's a great addition to the language. And of course, improving the ways that we work with nulls, null conditional awaits. If you were doing a lot of asynchronous work, you might have seen this before where you check if the task is not equal to null, simply await the task, otherwise just return null. We can now say await the task if it's not null. This here I expect though to be a little bit harder for them to implement because it's involving the state machine and all of that. Since C Sharp 6, they've wanted to introduce something called record types. Record types is a way for us to introduce a a DTO or a, a model, if you so like. So in this case here, I have my triangle of shape. It has all of these very standard things, right? And a lot of us do this all the time. We create DTOs for, for all the things in our domain. And it kind of gets tedious as well if you want to be able to introduce equality checks for the properties and so forth. So why not just allow us to say, I want a record of a triangle where I require a side of A, B, and C, and then this inherits from my particular type of shape here. When I compile this here, the idea is that it generates a whole bunch of different things. Of course, we get the constructor that shows us that this requires us to specify A, B, and C when we instantiate this here. It would introduce an equality check that if you compare two triangles, it will in fact compare the properties of that triangle and not compare the instance. That's pretty cool. And then of course, we want everything to be immutable, which means that you shouldn't be able to change the triangle once you've created it. In order for you to create a new triangle or change the triangle, you need to create a new one. And that's why we, here at the end, we have this thing here, it's creating a new triangle based on what we're passing into this with, with method here. It's a nice pattern. And then of course, getting a deconstruct out of, of this by default, so we can use pattern matching and use the tuple expressions and so forth. So I think this is one of the the better additions to, to the language, and hopefully this is gonna come soon. But they promised this in C Sharp 6. I think they had a, a version of this in C Sharp 6, and it was just scratched. The tough thing to do here is to solve this for inheritance. Personally, I think that they should just scratch the capability of doing inheritance. That's an easy way to fix it. But maybe that's just the consulting, consultant in me talking. <laughs> 
All right, so I showed you this as well, the declaration expressions. So why have having to write our character or declare that at the line above here when we're only using that inside our while loop here? That means that we could use the character after the while loop becomes nasty. Why not just allow us to do that in line with the while loop and only have it available in that particular context? So you kind of see a, um, a pattern with the features they, they add to the language. It's about avoiding nullability or avoiding us to do null reference exceptions. It's allowing us to write more code that's easier for us to understand. And in this case, it's going to be a little bit less error prone, right? Because we move that thing into that particular context and you know, no one can, can use that outside of this method. So if you have a lot of developers working on the same project, all of these small features make up for some really nice addition to the language. And it's kind of tedious for us to instantiate dictionaries, so why not introduce a syntax that allows us to, to make it a little bit better? And you see here at the bottom of, of the slides, I can share the slides later on, but I have references to the, the C-sharp language repository where they talk about all of these different things. So this here is going to introduce a new syntax that allows us to instantiate one of these dictionaries a little bit nicer and just figures out the types and, and so forth. Now finally, or one more feature that I want to talk about is extension everything. So one of the problems with extension methods in C-sharp is that we can, can't really extend things like the integers or the doubles or you know, the, the things that we don't really own that way. So in this case here, imagine that I have this interface that allows us to simply add this bar property on something. So whoever's implementing this interface will get the, the bar property. How about allowing me to add this to an integer? Wouldn't that be pretty cool? I don't know why you would, but you can do it. With extensions everything, you can say, well, I want to create an extension for integer. All right, so I'm saying create an extension for, for integer that I call int foo here. It's going to implement my particular interface. And then inside the context of my application, I can create a new integer, and I can then call x.bar here, and that will just work. There are some really nice applications to this here, but it's also very dangerous because all of a sudden you end up having some really interesting extensions in your applications and potential problems as well. But if you do a lot of math, it's nice to be able to extend ints and, and doubles and, and decimals and all of that and floats, you know. So I think it's a good addition for, for some use cases, but not for all of them. It's the same with the extension methods, right? They, they have their place in the applications, but I've seen a lot of developers abusing that as well. So, you know, use all the language features with caution and, you know, think twice before you just apply things in the apps and you'll be fine. So it's interesting because that's not all of the features that they're going to add, but the one, that's the ones that I'm smart enough to explain at least. We're also getting at something called type classes, which I'm certainly not smart enough to explain. I've read the, uh, the proposal for that language feature probably 10 times and I still don't get it. So hopefully we're never gonna get the feature because that'll make a hard time for me to make a talk about it. So, and they also wanna add the lambda discard parameter, parameter null checking, relaxed ordering of partial and ref modifiers, native ints, params of span of ints, attributes on the local functions, function pointers, and, and, and or assignment operators. So there's a bunch of features they wanna add to the language. And I've pr pretty much gone through all the, the champions and the things that they, they might add to the language and are, that's on their to-do list. But you know, we never know which features are going to get into the language itself. But hopefully some of the ones that I've talked about here in the C Sharp next part is gonna make it into the language. So now if, if we look at all the things that are happening in C-sharp from C-sharp 8 to C-sharp whatever the next version is gonna be, there's a whole bunch of interesting feature coming to the language. And I'm gonna highlight a few of them that I, I like and not like. I don't know why I highlighted the default interface method because I really don't like that. Oh well. You can see here there's so many things coming to the language. And you know, they're not done yet. So the language is evolving with all of us that are building software, they're adding things that make it easier for us to, to work with the language. They're making it easier for people that are working in other types of paradigms to make the transition over to C-sharp. If you work with F-sharp, you can pretty much write C-sharp like you would write F-sharp, or if you're coming from a Java world, you can probably do a little bit of C-sharp as well. So, you know, there's a lot of things in here that make it easier for us to, to build software, and I think it's a good addition to the language. So, you know, looking through whatever we got in C-sharp one through seven, people might have thought that this language is now done. There's not much more things to add to the language, but I reckon there's still a lot more to add to it. And if we look at the heaps of things they're doing improvements for in C-sharp eight and onwards, 
there's a whole bunch of things in here and they're probably not gonna stop there. And what's interesting as well with the languages and the compilers being open source is that the languages doesn't have, th they don't have to be, you know, have feature parity anymore. So VB and C Sharp no longer have to have the exact same features, which means that if there's a lot of C Sharp language designers working on C Sharp, they might ship the features for C Sharp faster than for, for VB. You know, the, there's a lot of things happening in the C Sharp world and it's a great time to be a C Sharp developer. And I think all these additions are awesome. All right, so that's it for, for my talk. I'm Philip Eckberg. It's been a pleasure talking to you. On your way out, please leave a green thing in the box. If you don't do that, tell me why so I can improve for next time. And if you have any questions, you can come up afterwards or just throw something in my face when you see me in the hallway. Thank you so much. <laughs>